selective. No, because uh, I can't hear you over myself. <laughs> okay, we're in the epistle reading for today, which is the last part of the Bible. And kind of it fits with the, the theme of today, uh, whether you start at the beginning or do you start at the end. Uh, some people like reading books. They read the last few pages to get the gist of what they're going to get, and then they read through it. I don't happen to do that, but I know some people do. So it's... Kind of interesting that we have the, the end of the Bible today. Uh, what's all going to happen when it's all said and done from the book of Revelation? So we'll pray and then we'll begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for telling us ahead of time and revealing to us what is going to happen so that we, as we go through the signposts along the journey of this earthly life, we, we see your hand at work and we see your promises being fulfilled. And therefore, in faith, we look forward to the ultimate promise being fulfilled, and that is your son's second return on Judgment Day or the last day, when once again, finally, we will be ushered into heaven once and for all, our sin taken away from us once and for all. And we will live in that beautiful place with you and all of our loved ones who have gone on before us in faith. And we look forward to that day. And so thank you for giving us a, a glimpse of the end a picture of the end to encourage us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're just going to jump right in because there's a lot of things to kind of go in, in and out here. So if someone just starts reading the, uh, the beginning of the epistle reading, we'll stop along the way. Okay, that's our first kind of snapshot uh, of what heaven is going to be like, at least in this part of the book of Revelation. So, once again, we have to be very careful when we start looking at the book of Revelation, uh, because we were not the ones given the, the revelation, we were not the ones given that vision, John was. And so John's going to use descriptions that he knows, not necessarily the ones that we know up to today. For example, when it talks about the earth being destroyed by fire, uh, usually we just think of a big matchstick lighting the whole thing and it goes up in, in tinder. But what if that was a nuclear bomb? It's a big flame, big whatever, but he doesn't know what nuclear bombs are. So he just calls it is burned by fire. So once again, the book of Revelation, the best way I can say how to approach that is to approach it much like the comics or a comic book. It's graphic pictures or pictures that explain to us what's happening. And we don't always understand 
the description to that picture because we weren't there in that time frame. And, and so when we take a look at this, I mean, this is not too bad. This is somewhat in, uh, easy to understand. There's a river going down the middle of the street. There's trees on the side. Uh, the, the leaves, are, you know, 12 kinds of fruit, uh, fruit each month. That just, once again, you can get caught up in the numbers, but 12 being 12 months of the year. So in other words, everything is taken together, together uh, and provided for each month for everything. And that river of the water of life only comes from the throne. So once again, it shows the only way we're saved is through what God gives us in Christ. Uh, Revelation, we're, we're not to take it literal, right? No, 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 no. Like what I, what I see here, <clears throat> they say there'd be no more night. Well, I, I recognize that as being there'd be no more sin because in the Bible, night, <clears throat> night refers to sin mostly. And kind of, yeah. Well, well, once again, you could be right. Other people could be right. Who knows? We're not there yet. But the whole point is they don't need lamp or sun because you think of where do we get our light today? Well, we get it from the sun. Well, where do we get it from? Because our planet rotates and spins and does all of the stuff that all those planetary scientists explain to us about. All God's saying here is there's not going to be need for created light because the light of God who created everything is going to be there. So we're not going to need that. So does that mean that there's physically not going to be nighttime? It's going to be like living up in Finland for uh, the four months of their half, uh, half a year where the sun just doesn't go down? Could be. We don't know. Once again, I, I agree with you, Jim. It, it, don't take everything as very literal because when you do, you're going to get bogged down. Into, what does that mean? Very simply, we get there. We win. I mean, that's what the book of Revelation really is all about. Because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, him ascending back to heaven, who's in control over all of creation now, when he returns on Judgment Day or the last day, separates the unbelievers from the believers, the unbelievers being uh, eternally separated and the believers ushered into heaven forever, we win because of faith. I mean, that's the, the simple way of looking at the book of Revelation. Because there's a lot of stuff that are head scratchers. What is that really talking about? What does it mean? Well, basically what it's talking about here are the tribulations that all Christians will go through out through time until he comes again. But if you get through all of those tribulations, here's the result. You get to be with God. You get to be in heaven where everything is taken care of. And there's obviously a lot more description language that even Jesus himself used, like the, the wedding banquet or, or those kind of uh, uh, pictures. Uh, so just look at it as a snapshot. John has given this snapshot. Here's what it, a glimpse, a very a Kodak, inst uh, uh, I'm dating myself, the instamatic moment, the Kodak moment. And he sees it, and he's trying to write down all of that stuff that he sees. But the point is, we're with God. There's nothing accursed. In other words, nothing sinful there. So if there's no sin, there's no death. and There's no more crying, no more tears. All of the grief, sorrow that we go through, pain and suffering down here is eradicated. It's gone. Because everything is perfect, just like it was in the Garden of Eden before we messed it up. I'm not going to ask a symbolism question. Sure. But I've read this in another part of the Bible, too. This is, how can that tree of life be on both sides of the river? I'm well, that right. that yeah, right? exactly. And yep. The water of life goes through the middle of the street, and on either side of the river, the tree of life is. So, once again, it's picture language. What does that mean? Does it mean like it's a great big, huge... I don't know. I'm just saying, 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 I'm just
redwood sequoia that's so big that some of those ones that are actually carved out and you can drive a car through, maybe the river goes through that because the tree is so big. Could be. I don't know. I'm not there. So uh, I, that's why we don't try to get caught up in the literal things. Because basically well, all that depiction, description is is depicting the fact that life is given 12 months of the year. Well, that's complete. So you've got your entire life taken care of. And you only get it through the water of life. Hint, water of life. And it only flows from God to people of faith. So if you're a believer, you get the water of life at your baptism that encourages you through your life, and that will get you to this place where everything is take, everything's provided for. Close enough? Yeah, everything is perfect. And, and, and he's hinting at the fact that you only get it from God. I mean, this is the only place you get it. The water of life flows from God. Uh, isn't that what Jesus said when he was down here, especially with the woman at the well? I can give you springs of eternal life. Be thirsty for eternal life. Well, because they provide that water of life. We get that water of life today when our baptism takes care of, where we're washed clean, God enters into our hearts and our lives, and he continues to, as it says here, heal the nations. He continues to work down here, although a lot of people, especially with that tragic shooting down in Texas, are going, once again, that age-old question, well, if God is a God of love, where's your God now? Where's God in all of this? And it's the wrong question to ask, because God is still here. Why do things like that happen? Human sin. It's your sin and mine. That's the consequences of our sin. We get terrible things happen. Doesn't mean that I physically pulled the trigger, but it's my human sin that has caused all of God's perfect creation that the John talks about is gone. And it's my fault, because I'm a sinner. I perpetuate, I continue on that human legacy of turning God's perfect creation into imperfection, into sin, into death, and all the devastating consequences that come along for the ride. I think when, when these things happen, disasters happen, we have to think of Romans 8, 28. Uh, you know, that, and not question that God will it, because God works all things for good. He does. But I gotta tell you, when you're in the middle of something like that, you question God, I don't care if you're a Christian or you're not. That's a sin, right? To question God? It, 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 you, you can consider it a sin, but it's a natural human response. Yeah. I mean, I mean, how many, how many of the so-called believers in God throughout the Bible, we see example of an example where they didn't trust God. Yeah. So, but what does Jesus say? Oh, ye of little faith. It doesn't mean that they, they, they're totally going against what God, but in the moment of doubt, when your son or daughter has been killed randomly, and you question God, I would do the same thing. But I look at it from a, a positive point that God uh, let this happen because maybe we're going to get gun control out of it and, and good things that are going to happen because of this. Uh, God can turn good out of bad, but I would hesitate to say that, oh, we're going to use this for gun control, one-on-one -on -one correlation. Obviously, take a look at the big picture that we're doing. This is where we end up, and maybe a tragic event like this might make people go to God more, because they need the help, they need the strength to get through this difficult time in their lives. But the opposite is also true. As I said, there's usually only two options when something bad happens. You either get closer to God or you get further away. There's no middle ground there where you just kind of go through the motions. Uh, that's a devastating time that can make or break people's faiths uh, a lot of time. But the, the whole point is there will be perfection when we get there. All of that's tears and sadness that whether it's a tragic event or pain or suffering because of a health condition, all of that's gone. And that's important to know. But in all that too is that God does not tempt us, God tests us. Bingo. Right. right. Because that's what the devil's doing. Where is your God now? If your God is so good, where is he now? 
If God is a God of love, why do these bad things happen? And he always points to God being the one who pulled the trigger. God being the one who did whatever. No, God didn't do any of it. Human sin did it. Yours, mine, and who's to say that you and I won't do something really bad? I mean, we would like to think we're a lot better. See, that, that's when it's the very, even the devil tempts us that way. Oh, I would never do something as bad as that. Well, that's because you and I try to put a sliding scale of sin. Murder, Texas, that's a big ass sin. Me fudging on my taxes or telling a white lie, well, that's just a little ass sin. Well, you know what? Doesn't matter to God, a sin is a sin. It's all big ass sins to God, and you do even one of them, you've lost it all. It's like that thread that you pull, oh, I got a thread, and it all unravels. Well, that's sin. Even doing once. See, we like to do that because we want to justify ourselves. I'm not as bad as that other person. So they did the big one, I just did a little one, as if to make myself better in and so there's even that temptation in that. Not to equate ourselves with someone like that. But that sin is no different than my sin, than your sin. It's all, what are the wages of sin? Death. Now, that will come in a lot of different ways. That one happens to be very tragic. Some die peacefully in their sleep, but we're all going to die. And where are you going to end up? I mean, that's the ultimate thing why God tells us ahead of time all of this and gives us this picture. That he's trying to heal the nations. He's trying to offer that water of life. He's trying to bring people into his family so that for an eternity, they live with him in that perfection. And they don't get eternally separated in the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's what we're to be about, too, is letting people know that. Whether we use picture language like this or just talking with our neighbor over the back fence. The job is still the same. There is going to come an end, and are you ready for it? And so all of the pictures, all of the vision, all of that revelation basically is now complete. And so we pick it up in verse 6. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirit of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. Okay, there's that little four letter word soon. That also gets people into trouble. It's been 2,000 years, God. That's not soon. What's, what are you doing? Why are you dragging your feet? We're having a crappy time down here. We're having to go through COVID or Uvalde, Texas. Where are you, God? You said you're coming soon. But we have to remember God is not ruled by time. He gave time to you and I. That's where the seasons and the 24-hour period and the 365 days on earth and goes, that's for us. But God is not ruled by time. Which is why the Bible says more often than not, a thousand years are like a day in God's sight. Because he's not ruled by time. He's complete. He's before time. So once again, it's to remind people that in every generation, you need to get your act together. Because death is coming soon for you. And where are you going to end up? Where are you going to spend your eternity? Let's continue in verse 12 and following. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Okay, there's another thing that could get us into trouble. I bring my recompense and I repay everything for what he has done. Therefore, we're getting to heaven on what we do, our good works, correct? That's what it says, doesn't it? For what we've done. That's what it says. Repay everything for what he has done. That's a trick question. I just want to see how you answer
I, I, would, I would agree with that. Re remember, what is a good work? When we do a good work, who technically is doing it? Holy Spirit through us. We're not doing it. We, we, we get the credit for it. As it says in the Bible, it was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Or it was credited to fill in the blank as righteousness. All they did was open up their lives so that God could use them. So when God uses us and we allow God to use us, it's still God doing the work. Because only he is good. Like Jesus said when someone asked him uh, about being good, he says, only my Father in heaven is good. So it's the goodness of God working through us to someone else through that action. But we get the credit for it. That's grace. And so when he talks about putting... So you've got to look at it through those set of lenses. So yes, he's breaking his recompense with them. So if you don't have faith, the boom is going to get lowered. Because you were told. You knew ahead of time. I've told you and I've sent prophets in the Old Testament, apostles in the New Testament, disciples like you and me today and in the future for however long God allows this creation to go on the way it is. There's always people letting people know so they can't, well, I didn't know. Well, yeah, you did. You just chose not to. So his recompense is you don't get to come in. The door is closed. Weeping and gnashing of teeth stuff for you. But for those in faith, we are having that, think of that a lot, much like a spiritual bank account. Every time we allow God to do a good work through us, he deposits that in our spiritual account. So are we going to get repaid for what we've done? Yes. But technically it's still not me doing it. I just get the benefits. Why? Because I have faith. Where did I get my faith? The water of life that came to me when I was baptized. And that God continues to work through me to do the things that he wants me to do. Which is why I don't know why we always leave out verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. That's because we're Lutheran. Lutherans hit justification, how you are saved, because there's a lot of wonky thinking in how you're saved out there. So we get that right, and we hit that hard, rightly so. But then we forget, well, what do you do with it once you have been saved? And we let them hang. We don't talk sanctification, how you live out your life of faith now that you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God so no one can boast. So there's God's grace, that undeserved love and mercy, he's shown to us right from Genesis chapter 3 when we screwed up in the garden. He still loves us. He still wants us to be saved. We only get saved through Jesus Christ and faith in him. That's still God's work. The water of life only comes from God. It doesn't come from anybody else or any other religion. So it's not our works so that we can look how good I am and boast about it. No, it's all God, 100%. But then we leave out verse 10. Okay, now that I'm saved, what do I do with my saving faith? You use it to further God's kingdom. For we are God's workmanship. Once again, God made us, not evolution. We didn't come from monkeys. Created in Christ Jesus, second birth, baptism language, so that we can do the good works that God in advance has prepared for us to do, working through us to do it. We get the credit. God still does the work, but he does it through people of faith. So when he says repay for what he has done, yes, we get paid in our spiritual bank account for allowing him to work through us. That's pure grace. It really is. Because we sinners can't do one thing good, not one. But God works through us to do those things and gives the, us then the credit. And then he goes on, I'm the Alpha, the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end, and I'm the complete. So now, we're now Jesus is talking. Okay, so let's continue on what Jesus is talking about here. Continuing in verse 14 and following. Okay, 
Very easy. How do you get into heaven? Those who have washed their robes, how do you wash your robes? In the blood of the Lamb. You come to faith and you allow the Holy Spirit to continue that faith. You come to communion, you come to Bible study, do devotions at home, whatever it is that you allow God and you to get strengthened together. And then you have that right to the tree of life and you get to enter the city through the gates. You get in if you have faith. Saving faith. Because some people say, well, I have faith. Well, yeah, but what do you have faith in? Well, I believe in God. Well, so does Satan. But listen, he's not getting in. So you have to have saving faith. A faith that trusts Jesus as your Savior. That, that's totally different than just someone who says, I have faith. A lot of people say they have faith, but you wonder what they have faith in. And so anyone on the, does that, they're on the outside. You don't get in. Pretty cut and dried, pretty simple. Faith gets you in, unbelief keeps you out. And you would think with something that simple, why do people just don't get it? It's because the Holy Spirit is the only one who can change a heart. You and I can't. We can witness, we can be that tool that God does the good work to try through us to change someone's life, but ultimately only the Holy Spirit can change someone's life through that water of life. It's not our job. We just are the ones who share it. And some people just, no thanks. Seems like heaven's not going to be crowded, does it? Well, especially for us Lutherans, because we think we're the only ones getting there, so it's definitely not going to be crowded. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. No, I didn't get any laughs, so I, I understand. Well, you know what I always say. Yeah. You don't have to be Lutheran to get there, but you get to be Lutheran after you get there. Okay, I like that one even better. Did you hear what Jim said? <laughs> he said, I just made my tongue in cheek says this. Jim was wondering, uh, heaven's not going to be that crowded because not a lot of people are going to be there. And he said, well, especially for us Lutherans because we're the only ones getting there. And he says, well, you don't have to be Lutheran to get there, but you'll may be made one once you're there. So, uh, the, the same thing. I like that one better. But yeah, there, there it is. God, God keeps it very, very simple. Not easy. Simple. So that even a child can understand it. You believe in Jesus as your Savior, you get in. I mean, that's simple language. There's not hoops you have to jump through. There's not fire you have to walk through. There's not a whole bunch of check marks on your grocery list of good works that you have to check off to get in. You simply let God be God in your life and give you the water of life and continue to heal you. That will leaves of healing that let you heal you recycle you, take out the sin, replace it with his righteousness daily through confession and forgiveness until ultimately we're finally taken care of and sin is eradicated and we get to go to this place. Absolutely. Well, see, there, and there are, there are denominations saying once saved, always saved. Uh-uh-uh-uh, you can lose it. You can lose it. The good thing is it can grow again. That's why I, my way of looking at what happens here is the Holy Spirit takes a little seed. It's called faith. He plants it in the fertile soil of that person's heart who's getting baptized. But that's all it is, is a seed. It needs to be watered, fertilized, nourished. And as it does, then later on when they mature, just like a plant matures, then it bears fruit the fruit of faith, as Paul would say. Kindness, goodness, love, joy, peace, self-control, all of those things. But it has to grow and it has to be nurtured. So just like a normal plant, if it's not watered and nurtured, will wither up and die. But you pour water on it, it'll, it'll grow again. It's amazing stuff like that. I mean, I remember reading an article once for a sermon a long time ago that the hottest place 
on this planet is Death Valley in California. And, and it, it gets hot there. But for one, one I believe it for was one week, it got rain. And it hardly ever gets rain. And all of a sudden, all these plants grew out there. And you think, this place is the hottest place, the most desolate place on this planet, and yet stuff still grows if it's watered. So you, that's why you never give up on people. Because on, until, like my sainted mother-in-law used to say, until that nail goes in my casket, there's still hope. What's that? Well, until the lid closes, but yeah, exactly. Until that lid closes, God can still work on that individual. And us too. And so once again, you never give up hope because God is always... See, that's the other thing. God isn't just somewhere out in heaven kind of watching down on us. He's here. He's intimately involved in our lives each and every day. He knows what's going on with us. And in that relationship of saving faith, he continues to save us each day. And give us what we need to get through this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Don't borrow tomorrow's troubles. Don't worry about what's coming down the pike. No, God each day will help me. That's where faith kicks in. I don't need to worry about tomorrow. I just take care of what's happening right now with God's help. And God is there. So that even though this is somewhere in the future, we don't know how long or how short it's going to be, doesn't matter. Because we know we're going to get there. The key is, you and I are now to try to bring as many people along for the ride. To get as many people in there, which is, goes along with our witness. Talking to other people about our faith, so that they don't get the door Closed. Okay, so let's continue in verse 16 and following. Okay, so just more titles, picture language of Jesus, the root and descendant of David. Once again, that was the promise given all the way back to King David, that one of his ancestors would reign on the throne. And too many people looked at it as an earthly kingdom, like we talked about last week uh, and the, with the disciples. Are you going to return the kingdom into Israel? We're still looking for an earthly King David. No, that's not what it's talking about. The throne is the ultimate throne where Jesus resides now at the right hand of God the Father in heaven with authority over all things. And on Judgment Day, the last day when he returns and that separation takes place of the believers from the unbelievers, then he hands that authority back to his Father. And we live forever in heaven, those of us who are going there. And so he's the bright morning star. Maybe that's an allusion once again to no night. He's the bright morning star. There's always going to be light. The light of God's love in our life all the time. And so because we want this to happen, look at verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. We want this to happen. The Holy Spirit wants this to happen. The bride, who's the bride? No, Jesus is the bridegroom. Who's the bride? Church. The church, the people of faith. We want to, don't we say, come Lord Jesus, let's, we want you here. We want you now. And let the one who hears say, come. In other words, it's going to get, as Jesus promised, a whole lot worse before he comes. And the fact that he even says that even that length of time of how bad it's going to get before he returns has been shortened so that even the elect, the ones who are going to heaven, can get in because it's going to be that bad. That's how terrible it's going to be. So we always lament, oh, is this the end times, pastor, because it's so bad. We have no clue how bad it's going to get. We really don't. We still have a good life here. I mean, we're not being oppressed. We're not being thrown into jail for our faith or tortured or killed like some of our fellow brothers and sisters are in other parts of the world. 
But for the most part, we have a pretty decent life. Which is probably why people just kind of, oh God, I don't need to talk to you. Because I got it pretty good here. I don't, I don't want to have to deal with sin and death and all that stuff. I just want to postpone that for a while. But it's going to get a whole lot worse. And that's why I say, come. We need you to come soon. Because it's the only way we're going to get through this. What's coming. And then we get the warning. And this is the one that, well, I'll explain it in a minute. So someone read 18 and 19. Okay, so the warning is, don't mess with it. That, that's about as simple as I can make it. Don't try to add to it. Don't try to take away from it. Leave it the way it is. And yet, how many times do people try to do over-explanation, over-interpretation, over, or they don't go as far as they should? And they try to keep it too simplistic. And there's a warning for both. You don't add to it, you don't take away from it. And there are churches, denominations, cults, if you will, that say, well, you don't have the full picture. Let me explain it to you. I've got secret knowledge that I can give to you. You've got to join us in order to get it. Well, no, I don't need to join that. Everything that I need to know is right there. I don't need to add to it. I don't need to take away from it. It's all right there. And then we get verse 20. And believe it or not, that's not the last words of the Bible. You would think it is, but it's not. I'll, I'll tell you what they are in the sermon, because I got it in the sermon. But there, that's, if you think about it, that's the culmination of everything from the book of Genesis. All those thousands of years of God's hand working, and then we get the end. Here's the picture of the end. And the one who testifies says, he's coming soon. We want that. Amen. Yes, it shall be so. Come, Lord Jesus. We want you to come. We want to be there. Just like Paul says, I would rather be in heaven rather than dealing with the suffering that he was going through on account of his faith and being a missionary for Christ. But he says, but for your good, that's why I'm still here. But he'd rather be there. Tell you the truth, I love you people. I love my wife and kids. I'd rather be there. I don't want to be here if I had a choice. But that choice is God still wants me here. So you put in the work to the best of your ability, letting God work through you and do it with joy because we know where we're going to end up. We don't have, it's, it's not one of those things like a, a Hollywood blockbuster movie where, oh, well, how's the ending going to happen? We've been told it. We've just been told what the end is going to be. We know the end. We know the story. We know how it ends. And we know it ahead of time. So we don't have to do any guesswork. That's why you don't add or take away, because you don't have to guess at it. It's right there. We win. Christians win. You get to go to heaven. That's, that's what it is. I don't think we put enough focus on when we die, that's it. That's the end. We go to heaven or we go to hell. Right. And that's why it's difficult when you start talking about some of those things because, once again, in the book of Revelation, it's talking about this thousand-year reign stuff, millennialism. Some are premillennialists. In other words, the Christians will get sucked out. You see bumper stickers. If all of a sudden the driver disappears, you know where they went. Like the rapture, that, that's the term that they use. There will be a rapture, and all the good 
Christian people get sucked up into heaven, then Jesus will come reign for a thousand years to give people a second chance to get their act together before Judgment Day. No, that happens all at once. In fact, it happens before, as Jim said. You, when you physically die, that determines your eternity. Because you either physically die with faith or without it. There's no gap between my physical death and Jesus' return that somehow I can regain what I lost. No. It's a done deal at the moment of your last breath. So if I die in faith, my soul goes to heaven to await judgment day. If I die without faith, my soul goes to hell. But we both wait for judgment day. When all the bodies will be taken out of the grave, souls and bodies put back together, both believers and unbelievers, everybody, and then the separation takes place. And so because there's no sin, then there's no death, that's why we have eternal life. We don't die again. That's, we live in heaven forever. But by the same token, the other side, they don't die either. But they don't die, they have eternal punishment weeping and gnashing of teeth forever. So as wonderful as heaven is, that's how bad separation from heaven is going to be. And we don't understand both extremes, to tell you the truth. We get picture language because we can't fully understand it in our limited human understanding. But when we're there, then we'll get the, bit, we'll get the full picture, pardon the pun. We'll get it. But the point is, surely I'm coming soon. Hang in there. It may seem a long time in your earthly history, which it is, but for me, it's not that much time at all. So hang in there. Keep telling people about your faith so that they can be ready for this too. Any final comments or questions before we close? Then let's pray. Once again, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for showing us the end. And we thank you, more importantly, for giving us your Son as our Savior and that water of life in our baptism to bring us to that saving faith. So we are 100% assured of where we are going to spend our eternity. But we know that the majority of the world does not know that, and so help us to once again open our hearts and our lives to your guiding so that you can work through us to spread your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Uh, right. You know what's going to happen to them. If you don't, well, if you don't have faith, you don't get there. Doesn't matter if you're two years old or 102. That's the tragedy. That even kids don't believe. I mean, we would like it to God to play nicey nice and say, "Oh well, I'll excuse God." Doesn't God is just? He has to punish sin. Now, for God's grace, He punished it on His Son, but you don't get that benefit if you don't believe. I mean, it, it's a it's a hard way of looking at it, but that that's what makes this so important because people want to sugarcoat it. Oh, I tried my hardest, and we'll get in. No. That's not the way it works. Well, exactly. Which is why Jesus said, oh, if one of, the, one of you causes a little one to sin, it's like a millstone would be better for that millstone and be dumped in the sea. Because where's that kid going to spend eternity?
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning as we are on the last Sunday of Easter before we hit Pentecost next week and then Trinity Sunday and then begin that long season of the Sundays after Pentecost. So usually when you get to the end of something you learn about something. Well that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today that God has already told us ahead of time what's going to happen at the end. It's almost like you took a book and you read the last few pages and you got the picture. You're not sure how you're going to get there, but you know what's going to happen. So that's basically how you and I are going through Christian life. We know where we're going to end up. We just don't know how we're going to get there and all the ins and outs that will be a part of our lives. And so we'll talk more about that in the sermon for today. Uh, for those of you at home following on the hymnal, we are once again going to do responsive prayer too which begins on page 285 in the hymnal. Our opening hymn for today is, since we're going to go back to front and so start at the end and move to the beginning, we're going to the last hymn in the hymnal. So we're going to sing hymn number 966. Please rise.
We turn in the front part of the hymnal to page 285, response of prayer to page 285. And as always, we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading for today is the return of the disciples after the ascension, which happened technically this past Thursday, but we observed it last Sunday. And what the disciples did as the beginning of the, uh, the New Testament church as they went about waiting for the Holy Spirit to come on Pentecost. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem so that the field was called in their own language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forth forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take place in this ministry, an apostleship, from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for today, which is our sermon text, is a glimpse or a picture of the end. From the book of Revelation, the first six verses of chapter 22, and also verses 12 to 20. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, These words are trustworthy and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what soon must take place. Now Jesus is speaking. Behold, I am coming soon, 
bringing my recompense with me and to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our gospel reading for today continues Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, verses 20 to 26. Please rise for its reading. Jesus said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue in the hymnal with the Kyrie on page 285. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated and invite the children forward for the children's message.
No, I don't know. We better get to it because we might be here until Jesus comes again. Wow, that's not as bad as I thought it was. Well, I'm going to start with something really good. Gum. Yum. Juicy fruit. That's even a good one. And we have a Lego block. I know he did because he had the box this week. And we have some special tape, electrical tape. Very specific. Are you ready? Oh, very cool flashlight. Yeah, I don't want to put it in your eyes. That gets pretty bright, wouldn't it? And last but not least, a very cool multi-tool that if you bend, you can get pliers, you can get knives, you can get a file, all sorts of really cool things to fix a lot of stuff with, right? Well, I'm going to start with the multi-tool because that's how I see Jesus. He does so much for us. He watches over us. He takes care of us. He gets rid of stuff from us like sin. He pulls the devil and, and bad stuff away from us. So he's kind of like the multi-tool. He does a lot of different things to help us out. And we need that because we don't have God in our life when we start when we're a little bit, a little baby. We need to be baptized. And if you heard what I was reading, I talked about the water of life. We can kind of think of as the water in baptism as our water of life. Because that's when Jesus comes and lives in our hearts and lives to give us life. And so maybe just like a tiny little building block is that little seed we called faith that's put in our hearts at our baptism. So that we, God, can build our lives upon this little foundation and make us grow God's way. Because we want to grow, and just like it says juicy fruit, we want to grow big and tall like a fruit tree and bear fruit. Now, we don't bear fruit like bubble gum or apples or bananas or anything like that. But they're good. I agree with you. And God provides that for our lives. You're right. That's right. And we're getting to that, Calvin. Very good. And, but we do bear fruit. We don't bear apples and bananas, but we do something called love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. Those are all what we call the fruit of faith, that little seed in our heart at our baptism that has grown so that we show these things to the world. Now, there's one important thing. We need the power to be able to do all those things because we can't do it on our own. And so when we think of like electrical tape, electrical tape, when you put two power things together, you wrap the electrical tape so it doesn't shock you. Well, we need that tape to keep us tightly with Jesus. Because if we're not with Jesus giving us his strength, his power, we're not going to be able to do anything. But when we do have power, we can shine the light of Jesus, his light, into all the world to show them the way, just like a flashlight in a very dark place shows us the way. Jesus, the light in our life, shows us the way to go to heaven. And so we can reflect that and show that light in our lives so that other people can know about not just Jesus, but how to get to heaven. So thank you, Jordan, for all these cool things for us to talk about today. Well, it was, yeah, he kind of went up into heaven, maybe not in the light, but it kind of held him by the clouds, so that was kind of cool. Okay, you got a color, Jordan? You sure? Okay, Calvin, what color do you think Jordan's thinking? Red. Red, not red. Jillian? Pink, pink. not pink. You want to try one, Haddon, or not? Haddon says green, no. not green. Well, back to you, Calvin. Green. Oh, yeah, your brother just said that one. Try another one. Well, it starts with yellow. It starts with a guh. Well, he said yellow, so I guess that's not guh. Okay, how about you, Jillian? 
Purple. Well, that doesn't start with God either, but whatever. Gray. Not gray. Oh, I thought it might have been that. Yeah, well, that's a God. God. That's what Jordan said. But it's different than gray and green. Uh, there's not too many guzz left. So try again, Calvin. We might be here a while. Brown. No, I don't think so. Okay, Jillian. Not black either. You're not getting the hint. Gold. Okay, I think we're all out of guesses. Whisper it in my... Well, that doesn't start with guh. <laughs> you were just teasing. Oh, you teaser. Okay, we're still going. It doesn't start with guh. He is fooling us. But it does have a G in it. Shh. You're not picking over there. Okay, Calvin. Did you hear what they said? What was the color? Did you hear it? Purple. Well, no, that was already guessed. Want to try again, Jillian? Not pink. Orange. Hey, there we go. We got there. Even though the trickster tried to get us off the beaten path here. So let's pray before you go back to your seats. Dear God, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sending Jesus to be our light. To show us the way how to get to heaven. To be our savior. To give us his strength and his power so that we can live lives pleasing to you. Help us to share him with others so that they can know about him as their savior and believe in him too and get to go to heaven. In his name we pray. Amen. There we go. There we go. There we go, ahead. There we go. Good. I'll even give you two. There's one for seven and one for three. So there you go. You get double prizes. And we'll get the box to you afterward. Haddon. There we go. Our sermon hymn is hymn number 384, and we will sing the first three verses.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today and every day from God our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As I said, our sermon text for today is our epistle reading, which gives us a glimpse of the end. Let us pray. Once again, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for revealing not just yourself, but also your word to us, so that we know what the ending is all about. We may not have gotten there yet, and we don't know what's going to be around the corner, at least down here on earth, but we do know where we will spend our eternity, in faith with you. So until that day comes, help us to remain faithful, sharing this faith with others, so that they too can not just get a glimpse of heaven, but come to faith in your Son as their Savior too, and see it face to face in eternity. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, are you the sort of person who secretly reads the end of a novel first? I know some people like that. Now that's a habit that's frowned upon, because after all, if the writer had wanted you to do that, they would have put the end at the beginning. But according to a new study, you no longer need to feel ashamed if you read the end of the story first. Researchers at the University of California's psychology department have discovered that people who like to read the end first aren't really spoiling the experience, but are in fact enhancing it. I don't believe it, but they make their case three ways. Number one, in this age of information, we become mildly obsessed with avoiding spoilers, staying away from the social media on our phones, lest we find out about the series finale of This Is Us, or the surprising twist at the end of that latest blockbuster movie. But that's a new habit. Mass culture for thousands of years told stories that were incredibly predictable. From the Greek tragedy, to the Shakespearean wedding, to the Hollywood happy ending. And what the research suggests is that this lack of a surprise is part of the pleasure. We like it best when suspense is contained, and we never really have to worry about the death of the protagonist or the lovers in a romantic comedy. We don't get shocked. So that's number one. Number two, just because we know the end doesn't mean there aren't some surprises. Even when we cheat and we read the final pages first, a good thriller will still surprise us with how it weaves the story to get to that ending. And so these researchers assert that perhaps we've overvalued the pleasure of the shocking ending at the expense of those smaller little astonishments along the way. Like life, they said, it's about the narrative journey, not the final destination. And number three, surprises are much more fun to plan than to experience. Our human minds are prediction machines, which means that it registers most surprises as a cognitive failure, a mental mistake. And aren't you and I usually trying to figure out all of the plot twists and turns before anyone else sees them to show how smart we are? Our first reaction is almost never, well, how cool, I never saw that coming. Instead, we feel embarrassed by our gullibility, the dismay of not seeing something that is as obvious as the nose on our face. Or maybe the planned surprise backfires and we get the opposite reaction than the desired result. And so once again, these researchers conclude that perhaps birthday presents are better wrapped in transparent cellophane and engagements not concealed in the chocolate mousse dessert at the end of the meal. How many times have you and I planned a surprise or what we thought was the perfect gift only to see the disappointment or horror-stricken look on the face of the recipient? 
Well, whether or not you agree with this new take on having the ending first and then starting at the beginning, I thought it might be a little bit interesting to maybe see this theory in practice. Take our three Bible readings for today. In our first reading from the book of Acts, we read that Matthias became the 13th disciple and that there was also a 14th one being considered. And that went back to the call of the first disciples by Jesus, where Matthias or Justice are never mentioned. Yes, did you know that there were men who were disciples from the very beginning, who were not part of that inner 12? Does that shock you? Would you have liked to know that before reading the Gospels so that you weren't shocked at this reading from Acts? Do you feel a little dumb not knowing that? Would you have paid more attention to Judas then, who isn't at the end of the story? And if so, then the researchers got it right. That is our gospel reading for today. In this section of Jesus' high priestly prayer, Jesus is referring to the fact that he has told his disciples ahead of time what was about to happen and what the ending was going to be, not only in their own time frame in Jerusalem, but also at the end of time in his return. Kind of like reading the last pages of the book or the movie script so that the surprise ending won't catch them off guard. Now maybe if those early disciples had paid more attention, they wouldn't have deserted Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or still been behind locked doors on Easter and the days following. And then there's our sermon text from the literal last page of the Bible, the book of Revelation, talking about the wonders of heaven and our place as believers in it, far away from all the sadness and the grief of this sin-filled world. And isn't this heavenly picture something we start telling others first? Especially when they're feeling down and depressed? Like there's nothing to live for? It gives hope in the midst of despair that God has everything all mapped out according to his plan with no major plot twist that will take that promise of heaven away from us. It's guaranteed because of Christ. So maybe those researchers are on to something. Perhaps people down through the centuries wanted something safe and predictable when it came to their eternity. And just because they knew the ending, that didn't mean they were not told to slow down and stop and smell the roses along the way. They were reminded that their Lord and God was with them throughout the entire journey through this earthly life to our eternal life. And then to focus on their daily blessings along that path. And last but not least, knowing where they were headed to minimized the doubts along the way since there was no major surprise, no upheaval from a potential change in God's mind about saving us. God has promised it, they believed it, and that settled it. Same for us. Now, having said all of this about putting the beginning at the end and the end at the beginning, I still think personally. It's better to go in the order the writer of the book or the movie script penned so that the last page is the last page. Because sometimes knowing something ahead of time of what will happen, especially when there's no context of how to get there, can lead people into taking the end for granted or the opposite, dismissing it altogether if it doesn't come soon enough for them. That's what happens when people read verse 20 of our sermon text without the context. Jesus said, 
He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Well, it's been 2,000 years. That's not soon. Without the proper context. But when the context is given that for God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Ah, now we get it. That the one who said this promise may be a while, humanly speaking, because he's not ruled by time like you and I are. And therefore, we need to be patient and faithful for God's timing rather than considering this promise of failure and dismissing him from our lives because his timing doesn't fit our earthly timing and our insatiable need <clears throat> for getting what we want now or even yesterday. Well, let's take that thought a little step further. If there is no mention of sin first and how it came to be, and that all of us humans are affected by it, which then leads to eternal death and damnation, then people don't think they're sinners in need of a savior who can save them both from their sin and also open the door to heaven to them. The law always has to come first before the gospel or both are useless. If we share the gospel first, that Jesus loves them and has died for them to pay for their sins on the cross without explaining first the need for him to come down to earth and die on the cross to take our punishment, then we never get to the law. Well, people will question, well, why then? Why did Jesus do it, especially when he was sinless? That's not fair. And if our answer is just, well, because he loves you, then the inevitable question follows. If God loves us so much, why is there still suffering in the world? Why do bad things happen like that shooting down in Texas? And then the blame then goes on God rather than on us humans and our sin where it all started and still belongs. The flip side of that coin is if we're only telling people the law that they're going to hell without Jesus, which is certainly true, we'll never get to the gospel because people will go to the other extreme and see God as some vengeful God judge that just needs to be appeased by something we can do, which then puts our lives on that spiritual treadmill of good works in order to try to work off our sin. And first of all, our works are never good if God isn't involved in them because it's God doing it through us. And second, that then leads people to despair, knowing, have I done enough to balance that scale in our favor? And as an aside, we can never do enough, hence the need for a Savior who died on the cross for us. Law, then gospel, context. Knowing that heaven is ours and that Jesus is coming soon in his timing, and that he is now with us even right up to the very end of the age and his second and final return is something that only comes to us through faith. Through that water of life that flows from heaven that was poured on us when we were baptized and made us part of God's family. It's what helps us trust in our Savior Jesus when we are bombarded daily by all the plot twists and turns to our daily lives like a job loss, a marriage breakup, or the diagnosis of cancer. Knowing the end ahead of time gives us the strength to meet the present and what is with hope and assurance rather than dwelling on the past and the what ifs which lead us into doubt and despair. And so to even give our sermon text its proper context, we need to add the last verse of God's word to us in the Bible. Yes, there is one more last verse, which I don't know why the editors who planned these Sunday readings left out, because it brings everything into its proper context. The last verse 
which concludes all that God wants us to know. From the right Bible, as my wife would say, the NIV. Yeah, there is a right Bible. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Let me tell you that one more time. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. That sums up the Bible beautifully. God's grace, his undeserved love and mercy to us sinners, which only comes through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and the water of life at our baptism, makes us God's people and gives us the forgiveness and the strength to get through this veil of tears to the joys of heaven. And so as the sainted Reverend Oswald Hoffman, speaker of the Lutheran Hour, used to say, what more is there to say but amen, which means it shall be so, whether you read the last pages of the Bible first or not. Amen. And now may the peace that far surpasses all of our human understanding that comes from knowing we know the end and what's going to happen. May that give us encouragement and strength for the living of today and not worrying about tomorrow. In his name we pray. Amen. We continue by singing the last two verses of hymn 384. Continue in our hymnal on page 286 with the versicles. We will then pray the collect of the day printed in our bulletin for this morning, followed by our insert prayers. Hear my prayer, O God, that my cry come to you. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. 
Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. And I glorify your name forever. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say evermore, God is great. Save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. We pray the collect of the day printed in our bulletin for this morning. O King of glory, Lord of hosts, uplifted in triumph far above all heavens, leave us not without consolation, but send us the Spirit of truth, whom you promised from the Father. For you live and reign with him in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Once again, dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace as dear children asking a dear Father. And so we pray for those who are going through these difficult times and for those who need your strength. We continue to pray for Sophia, Joel, Renata, Barb, Edna, Cheryl, and thank you for her good results, Anne, Bob and Joyce, Rachel, Hilda, Katie, Pat, Caroline, Esther, Rosina, Wayne, Trudy, Joan, Velma, Harold and Doris, Walter, and we also add the people that are on our hearts and our minds today, those that we will receive a presentation about shortly after our service, and that is for Ayu, Ryaka, and their son, Adam, who are currently hiding in Greece. Continue to be with each and every one of them, and we know that you know far better than us what is needed, and so we place them, as always, even our own lives, into your care, knowing that you will do with us what is best and good. Continue to be with our shut-in members, who are unable to be with us. Continue to provide encouragement for them. Be with our brothers and sisters at our Savior Lutheran Church in London, and our pastor, Reverend Dr. Ken Vagy, Rebecca, and his family. Continue to work through them to bring about the saving of people through the sharing of the gospel, law, then gospel, so that they too can be part of your family. Be with our earthly leaders, Today we remember our Ontario Parliament and our Premier Doug Ford, that you would continue to provide wisdom from on high and how to best lead their lives of public service for the benefit of your people. And especially during this election time, we pray that you would use us to bring people into those places of authority that are God 